Welcome everyone to our exclusive webinar on how to prepare for the post-COVID-19 service supply chain. My name is uh, Thomas Igu. I'm the head of content at Copperberg and I'll be moderating the discussion today. I'm joined, um, as you can see, by um, a large group of fantastic guests. And I'll get around to the introductions uh, very shortly, but before I do so, a few announcements. So the recording of the webinar will be made available to all participants. And if you have a question for any or all of the panelists, please submit them at any time during the discussion via the Q&A button on your Zoom control panel. Now, if you're worried about the growing backlog of scheduled and unscheduled maintenance events and inventory levels in your service supply chain, you're not alone. Organizations around the world are all struggling with travel and on-site work restrictions, reduced recovery rates for parts and dwindling inventory as the global supply chain has been thrown into chaos. And the greatest challenge is still ahead as the industry prepares for a surge in customer demand for service, as we see already many countries across Europe lifting restrictions but while at the same time dealing with enormous backlogs. And of course, with the overall uh, loom of a resurgence of COVID-19 uh, in the near future. So how can organizations prepare for this? This will be what we'll be discussing today. And joining me are Oliver Lenowski, CEO at OnProcess. Hi, Oliver. Hi. Raoul Singh. CEO at Entercoms. Hi, Raoul. Tom Parker, CEO at RL People. Hi, Tom. Hello. Rich Agostinelli, CEO at Buybox. Hi, Rich. Good afternoon. Hello. Morgan Wilkins, Head of Supply Chain at Orange Business Services. Hi, Morgan. Hi, everyone. And then Sam Michaels, CEO at Flash Global. Glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Happy to be here. So before we get started, actually, um, Oliver, I will ask you to enable share screen um, ability for the host. If you click uh, on the little button next to the share screen at the bottom of your control panel. And what I'm going to do is play a short video that will uh, set the scene for the discussion today. We live in an as-a-service world which is focused on uptime, and within that, recurring service revenue is the lifeblood of many of our businesses. Customer experience is, of course, the key to retaining that revenue, but in order for us to deliver that great customer experience, the service supply chain engine must be running effectively and efficiently. Now that engine has three key components that function in an operational rhythm. Planning, delivery, recovery, planning, delivery, recovery, repeat. Where planning is making sure that the right inventory and the right labor are in the right place to fulfill customer needs when needed. Delivery is about then getting those parts and the labor to the right place at the right time to fulfill a service event. And recovery is about getting as much value as possible back from the parts used in the field. This system is fragile at the best of times. But then when something catastrophic hits like COVID-19, we feel the ripples across the whole ecosystem. Work and travel restrictions have shifted priorities to put out fires. Delivery grinds to a halt and on-site visits are restricted to only the most essential break fix calls. For some of our customers, we've seen that field service events are down 50 to 75% and in their place, there's an increase in customer replaceable units supported by remote field engineers. Recovery is sitting idle as well. Parts are sitting unused or defective in the field, and we're seeing returns volumes drop to as much as 90% for some of our customers. That means that repair lines are sitting idle and spare parts inventories are starting to run dry. 
that gives the planning teams very few options. They're struggling to buy new because prices are rising, budgets are tightening, and the global supply chain is in chaos. And there's limited availability of stock from overseas suppliers. Now, the good news is, as we all know, this will end and we will get back to business as usual. But in the supply chain, restrictions being lifted will just be the beginning of the real issues. We've already started to see this. For example, in China, where there was an immediate 30 to 50% surge for service events after easing of restrictions. At the same time, massive backlogs and unscheduled service events and unrecovered parts exist around the world. And then there's the customer experience. As those restrictions are eased, the customer expectations will return to normal without the normal capacity for us to deliver on them as an industry. So what are the risks? Well, if we start missing contract SLAs, that could mean customer attrition. Huge new buy spends, a cost that could cripple our businesses. And in short, catastrophic failure of the service supply chain. With these risks and challenges, we also see opportunity. And we're hearing the same kind of questions come up from many of our customers. How can the industry best manage this backlog and pent up demand? What expectations should we all be setting with our colleagues and with our customers to get our service operations engine back to normal? When will customers start to demand performance again, rather than continue to forgive misses? And should the industry be preparing for aftershocks or second waves of COVID-19? And if so, how do we do that? Okay, gentlemen. So what I would like to start with um, is ask everyone about what is the greatest impact they have seen from uh, their organization or, or their customer base in terms of um, COVID-19? How has that most impacted uh, organizational service uh, supply chains? Because we've seen a lot of numbers uh, in the video in terms of drop in field service events, uh, unused parts, uh, the, the return logistics dropping up to 90% as well. What has what have you seen as the biggest challenge? Maybe Morgan, if you if you want to start with that. Sure. Yeah, I can uh, I can start with that. And so I'm from uh, Orange Business Services. Recently joined uh, OBS, and previous to that, I spent almost 19 years with Cisco. So I I've, I've seen um, seen a lot of different uh, uh, issues like this in the past, but nothing quite on this scale. Uh, I think what I, certainly what I've seen from my perspective in OBS at the moment was a significant drop off, not just in service events, but just uh, customer interaction in general, whether it's rescheduling, um, cancellations, um, or, or the drop off in uh, RMA demand, uh, somewhere in the region of outbound demand going down by around 80% in, uh, in a number of different areas. But it's also been the variety of, uh, of different scenarios that we've seen globally, obviously based on the timing of where, where um, COVID has, has, uh, has had an impact. It's kind of rippled around the world and we've seen that have different impacts at different times. Um, some customers you know, globally just shut down immediately. Others, it was a more gradual closure and that, that gave us a bit more time to plan. But there is a, a huge amount of uncertainty that still remains in the market. Um, many, many of our customers, they'll talk to us every week, but there's no commitment on when things are going to start back up again. So that there is a huge amount of pent up demand on the inbound side, um, you know, extra, extra inventory starting to build up, but the outbound, there's just complete uncertainty at the moment about when things are going to open up and, and what we're likely to see. Yeah. And, and Sam, what about you? Hi, I'm uh, Sam Michaels, uh, President and CEO of Flash Global. Uh, again, happy to be here. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, echoing a little bit of what Morgan just stated, but a little bit differently uh, because I'm coming at it from a, a, a bit of a different angle. Um, we've definitely seen a slowdown, a significant slowdown on the inbound supply of inventory or spare parts uh, to be able to fulfill service events for our customer stable. And our customer stable is everything from, you know, the high-tech vertical to the medical vertical to uh, power and energy vertical. And it's uh, impacting uh, the various verticals a little bit differently. I would say that high-tech uh, is getting hit 
the hardest as far as the amount of available supply and inbound flow of parts. But with that being said, I think the high tech space is much more prepared for what is happening and what is taking place because as Morgan alluded to, th there have been um, global incidents, regional incidents, localized incidents in the past where we're able to manage and persevere through as we're doing now, but there, it's time definitive for the most part, right? You had a start of maybe it's a hurricane or an earthquake or um, some type of terrorist attack, but then there's an end to it, right? There's a foreseeable end that's pretty much known. And so you plan around that. In this case, it's a little bit of an open-ended end, so to speak. Um, and that makes things a little bit um, uh, up in the air. But on our outbound side, a little bit differently, on the outbound side, we've seen a significant drop in what I would call preventative maintenance and scheduled maintenance versus customers really attacking a hard down or some serious performance degradation in their network, so to speak. Um, and why I say the high-tech side is, I think, a little bit more prepared for this, just from a pure product set perspective, is that many of our customers have their, their products configured and built to be fully redundant, no single points of failure, so how long they can live with performance degradation and not have to perform maintenance, I think, extends out um, how, how uh, their customers can run and still be effective without having, as you alluded to in the short video, um, the labor, the parts, it can wait, so to speak. Um, but, but make no mistake about it, um, what we're hearing, and we'll get into this a little bit more from our customer base is it's the inbound supply uh, and the manufacturing of those parts uh, should start picking up in calendar Q3, the July, August timeframe. Uh, and that's what we're forecasting against. But, but ultimately, um, th those are some of the, I would call the, um, I would call it negative, but some of the negative impacts. But on the positive side, we've actually seen a redefined focus, a redefined energy on what matters with our customers and what our customers are focusing on, limiting scope in order to drive the biggest impact on what we're going through now and how they prepare themselves coming out the other side uh, to be more in tune, more focused, more aligned within their service supply chain and the infrastructure. Okay, thank you, Sam. Um, Tom, do you want to, to give your inputs? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I have probably a slightly different view of this because we specialize in recruitment and consultancy. So we tend to notice and feel the impact of um, uh, any change in the market relatively quickly. And the biggest area where we've seen a turn down is in the furloughing of um, field service engineers, operatives. So those individuals that are actually out there doing the events, which are, which are hands-on. So um, those guys have been off now for six weeks, eight weeks, and even the HR teams that support them have been, have been off. So we start to see that come back over the last two, two weeks. We start to see HR teams come back in, and there's an appetite to bring individuals back into place so they can reaccess the supply chains, reaccess the sites. However, there is this unknown. The unknown is how do they go and do that in a safe way? How do they work with their client? How do they retrain the uh, field service engineers in the right way so they can get access and be reintroduced properly? So the positive side is businesses are coming back. We've seen a lot of new opportunities coming through and at a senior level, more executive level, uh, there's been certainly not a lot less following and a lot more um, analysis of, of what is needed. But the, the challenge I think the market is going to see is once these individuals come back in, and particularly on the reverse side, is how they train them up and get them back on site while still juggling what is a forward supply chain demand, uh, which is also pent up and built up. So there's this bow wave there of opportunity. It's just a case of how quickly organizations are going to be able to deploy the right individuals to the right places to actually tackle it. And, and certainly that's what we're seeing a lot of. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, Rich, what about you? Sure, hi, I'm the CEO of BuyBox. And for those of you who don't know BuyBox, our, our solution's designed to help our customers meet their SLAs and improve productivity, getting the right part to the right place at the right time. 
Uh, we do that by giving them the ability to securely place uh, critical repair parts close to the point of service, have visibility to the movement of those parts, and reallocate them. And we handle both, uh, both delivery of new parts and return parts. Uh, and I think in terms of the impact, uh, even though many of our customers are considered essential businesses, and we operate primarily in the UK, uh, obviously we saw a precipitous volume drop in the movement of, of parts uh, when the country effectively closed down. Even those essential businesses were only performing essential services, if you will. Uh, and so we had to throttle back and, and be able to deal with that while still meeting our own service levels. Uh, now we're starting to, to talk about uh, coming out of that. And I think as one of the other panelists said, one of the good things about this is that we've had developed a much closer relationship to our, our customers and there's a lot more dialogue going on. Um, there's a huge amount of pent up demand. We're tens of thousands of service calls just in the customers that we deal with. Um, but some things that have come out of this, first of all, is, is an increased um, focus on safety. Uh, people are concerned about handling parts and whether, uh, whether the virus can spread on parts and so how those, uh, what kind of personal interaction they need to have uh, when touching the parts, et cetera. Uh, and so an increase uh, focused on safety as well as a continued focus on 24 seven availability. Uh, but the other thing that came out of this and related to that is the need to move personal protective equipment through the network, uh, both new and used. Um, that was one thing that I didn't really anticipate going into this. Uh, but uh, interestingly, and encouragingly, I guess, is that after several weeks of, of our volume being off dramatically, uh, last Friday we had the busiest day, believe it or not, in the history of our company. Uh, but the vast majority of that was not repair parts, it was PPE. And it was our customers bursting PPE out to their engineers in anticipation of uh, restarting. Now, the other thing that's come throughout this, this crisis, of course, is once they're wearing the PPE, what do they do with it uh, when they're done? Uh, they don't want to bring it home. They don't want to throw it in the trash. They can't leave it. They can't leave it at the site. And so we've been called upon to try to move that back safely through our network. So, so again, safety, availability, and uh, within the PPE uh, uh, or within the safety realm is the PPE. So we're it's feeling like we're going to start to see uh, a pickup here. There certainly is pent up demand. Uh, I think we're going to start to see it in June and hopefully pretty dramatically in July. And Raoul, what about you? What do you see uh, has been the, the biggest impact so far? Hi everybody, I'm, uh, I'm Raoul Singh. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Endicoms. You know, so uh, from, from Endicoms, uh, if you are not aware of Endicoms, you know, we, we actually don't run a supply chain, but we help uh, our customers run, plan the supply chains through control towers, making sense of data and so on and so forth. So we do get to see sort of what's happening in the, in, 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 in the industry in general. You know, one of the things we, uh, to echo some of the points that other panelists have made, uh, it's very true that the demand the dynamics have shifted drastically. They've dropped uh, substantially in many, many areas. But really the, what, the way we are seeing the situation evolve is very interesting. So anyway, we are moving from the sort of the react phase, which I would call the first, you know, four to six weeks of the, of the crisis to a bit of a learn phase, you know, what really happened, you know, what can we start to learn from it? But in the react phase, you know, as, as, as things just kind of, there was no playbook for this. So as demand sort of fell off, you know, from field service events going down and so on and so forth. Uh, so there's a massive drop in certain regions of the world. And we saw this wave, you know, so starting from China, you know, so demand dropping just substantially and then sort of the rest of the world not seeing any change to all of a sudden you, know, you have a, uh, a drop in the rest of the world, but China is picking back up. So you have very interesting demand dynamics, especially for people who have global supply chains playing out. And then on the other side, you had the supply issues building up because a lot of suppliers happen to be in China. A lot of parts are sourced from China as well. So, so we've had this very interesting uh, dynamics between demand and supply at the tactical level. But, and and, and as, as, as companies are struggling with understanding what to do, you know, the, one, the other thing we've seen is that 
some of the companies have actually used the resiliency that was already built into their supply chains. Because as you know, the service supply chains are kind of designed to be res resilient to start with. I mean, you have just in case demand coming up. But the, but the question now companies are asking is that, hey, have we exhausted that resiliency already? And what does it mean? So again, uh, most companies are seeing that, hey, they had, they had no real pay. I mean, they, they, they can deal with small variations in demand and supply, but you know, they're not ready to deal with massive variations. And, and no one has an idea right now on how the longer range dynamics will work out. So now what we're seeing is companies having reacted to some of the shifts in dynamics are beginning to learn from it, seeing what the data is going to tell them, build scenarios to see what that means for them in the future. Really the question for a lot of companies that we work with is where should the inventory be positioned? So going forward, what the expectations will look like, customers. So therefore calibrating their inventory positions, networks to deal with customer demand shifts or expectations is, is there really the challenge which, which we see evolving now. Okay, <laughs> interesting. Yeah. And Oliver, what about you? Um, so I'm Oliver Lemansky. I'm the CEO of On Process Technology. Uh, we are a managed services provider, uh, and our primary business is is, um, is managing the order desk, getting parts to customers or engineers or, or returns, getting them back again. Um, and there's there's two things really that we've seen. I think that are that kind of complement what what the other panelists have said. Um, I agree with with Morgan's comments and also Sam's comments about variation. It, it, there's huge variation going on across geography and across verticals. But one thing that seems to be happening is there, there are lumps forming in supply chains at the moment. Some, for, some, for some industries, that's um, a, a backlog growing in returns. For some uh, who are, have been reliant on certain countries for repair um, factories, those uh, repair factories might be the backlog. Other countries um, haven't shut their repair um, uh, uh, sites down. Some countries suddenly shut them down for a short amount of time, then reopen them again. So these lumps have formed. Sam, Sam's point about um, service event, scheduled maintenance events being kind of put on the back burner for now, we've seen that in almost across the board uh, with, with our customers, where there is now a, a huge amount of focus has been put on break fix and on getting stuff up and running, especially in two or four hour time critical, um, uh, very tight SLAs uh, contracts. But some of the more uh, scheduled stuff, the preventative stuff, has just not happened. And that, that's a variety for a variety of reasons, as was mentioned in the video. The other area that we've really seen is distraction. So I, I, I love Rich's story about talking about his network dealing with the PPE stuff, uh, the PPE clothing. Um, network which is designed for uh, spare parts being then used to, to move um, uh, you know, protective equipment around and, and clothing around. If you look at the number of conversations that we have had with our customers in the last couple of months where they're saying, listen, I really want to talk about the program that we've got ongoing, but at the moment I'm trying to find masks for my engineers and I'm the supply chain person in the company and right now I'm on mask duty, so just come back to me. And I think there is, so whilst these lumps have been forming in the supply chain, there's also become this sort of distraction, if you like, for, for um, the supply chain groups working within big manufacturers and now, now that the, the sort of uh, novelty is the wrong word, but now that that's worn off and this is becoming, starting to come more business as usual, I think people are now starting to come to terms with, okay, well, can we continue to delay some of these decisions that we have? What is the impact of these lumps sitting in our service supply chain? If we can't get the returns back and we can't repair them, what are we going to send out, right? Are we going to, are we going to turn to the CFO and say we're going to spend a ton more money on, on new inventory? Can we even get it if we want to? So above all, I think um, you know the, the the combination of those lumps and the and the distraction factor has created a lot of um, uncertainty in the industry. Okay, well, f following up on that, actually, one area I wanted us to to explore a bit now, um, when we are uh, almost in June and across Europe. Um, companies are start or countries are starting to lift restrictions what should companies be focusing on now when it comes to their service supply chains if, if you think about it from a perspective of um, kind of the 
tactical operational uh, fixing of issues or looking more on the long-term strategic decisions especially if they take into consideration what has been going on for the past two months and maybe what lessons they've learned so are, are we still should we still be focusing on the short term or should we start to look more uh, to the long term maybe opportunities also represented uh, by what happened what do you think, Howell, maybe to pick on you to start with first? Let me unmute. Yeah, so so I, I think one of the things, uh, as a, that's a great question because now, you know, literally back to the thought process that, hey, you know, we sort of are, you know, getting out from the react phase into the learn phase. And I guess the next phase is going to be the adapt phase. So what have we learned and what are we going to do about it? So, so so i think one of the things that you know let's break down into two parts you know for at least from my perspective one is you know we have to get ahead of the tactical aspects of just managing the day-to-day -day business which is hey getting the parts for the right customers making meeting customer expectations slas and so on and so forth so make sure that the tactical supply chains are running make sure we connect all the dots and the supply and the repair side and so on and so forth to keep things up and running uh, and but at the same time we have to start looking at the structural changes we're going to make because I think this has really kicked, I mean, one of the things this crisis has done is really increase the need for understanding the role of uh, resiliency in, in building our, or running our supply chains. So what people are gonna be looking at very much is looking at, hey, are we structurally organized? Are we structurally resilient? It's not just about variations in demand and supply that we can deal with, but can we deal with, you know, for example, there's a question there in the, in about supplier failures. You know, do we, how do we model that? especially in, in the service supply chains, you have long you know, end of life parts, you know, you're gonna have a you know, single source part and you don't have a supplier to deal with, but that's a massive risk. So people have started looking at risk in a new different light. Uh, things have to be redesigned, possibly networks have to be redesigned and SLAs have to be redesigned. You have to start to understand better, collaborate with customers better to say, hey, you know, Mr. Customer, what are the right SLAs for us to manage under, right? So not just for this crisis, but structurally going forward and also i think one thing that is is throwing up is that hey how do we best utilize the data we have we have a lot of data the problem is a lot of data is locked up and and a lot of data is still very internal we have to combine the data we have internally in our companies to data that is available you know across the company you know you have to look at other patterns out there economic patterns suppliers customers and so on and so forth so i think there's a lot of structural rethinking to be done in how do we build and develop. So never waste a crisis, like people say, this is the time to actually get ahead of it and then make some structural changes. Yeah, well, Morgan, uh, actually then to, to go off to you, wh what's your point of view on that? And uh, now in, in the past two months, maybe, what did you rely on the most uh, to get through kind of the day-to-day -day operations? Mm. Was it mm. the data or the technology? Was it the people, uh, the processes? How did you get through these times? It's a, it's a great question. And, and yeah, again, as I said, I'm, I'm relatively new to, to Orange. And uh, this was probably one of the best uh, learning experiences I could have gone through. Um, as Rahul said, never waste a good crisis. And, and I think supply chain people step up when crisis hits uh, because we know what to do. We know how to just knuckle down and get, get on with things. Uh, what was really great was uh, we, we initiated immediately uh, a global uh, a global council that met every day for an hour and all we did was get on the phone and talked about what are we seeing and we started gathering that information and started to put it into a structure that allowed us not only to understand it within that group but also now to then share that with the rest of the organization so we could demonstrate to the rest of the organization that um, we we understood what was going on so um, to Rahul's point, we were reacting and we were learning about what was going on in the global environment. And then we were starting to share that um, and contextualize it with other pieces of data within the organization. Uh, to, to answer your question, what did we rely on most? People. Right from the start, it was people. Um, we've got guys on the ground in multiple countries all around the world. Um, we've they're reaching out to their contacts within the suppliers, within uh, other areas of the business, and just finding out what's going on. What's the temperature on the ground? 
but very quickly we started to realize that okay that was that's what's going to help us keep things going in the short term so your first question was what is it is it tactical or is it strategic well the answer is yes it's both it has to be both we've got to keep the wheels turning we've got to keep everything moving that we can in a way that allows us to satisfy whatever customer demand is out there but very quickly we got on to scenario planning for the future so it was taking a look out and understanding well what do we know what information do we have that we can start looking at some various some different scenarios that we, we looked at a number of different ones so the you know the the u-shaped curve the l-shaped return the on again off again um, curves and you know that uh, perfect storm where everything stays really depressed for a very long time uh, and again we looked at it across multiple dynamics so what data and analytics do we need around those various scenarios uh, what do we need to understand from our suppliers and partners about their ability to deal with these different scenarios uh, what would change with customer expectation in those different scenarios and how would our people react in those different scenarios so we had to think about resilience in all those different areas and be able to just plot out to the best of our knowledge what we thought might happen and then what plans we'd need to put in place but then also what were the triggers what are we looking for to tell us which scenario is heading our way and Rahul mentioned it as well it's a mix of internal and external having that analytics capability internally which I have to say was was not where I'd want it to be when we started this but very very quickly we got things in place we discovered people who had skills who had uh, business intelligence capabilities uh, we put things together and now we've got the formation of a business intelligence team who are looking at the internal motion but then also the supplier managers the partner managers the vendor managers who are looking at the external conditions bringing those together to really start to understand which scenario are we facing and where are we facing it? Because we're gonna face different ones in different places. So getting that scenario planning done, for me was absolutely critical for us then to build a future looking view, which will develop into that adapt phase, which will be the future strategy that we'll build as we're coming out of this. Interesting, yeah. Um, okay, before I go on to, to the next panelist, can I ask Oliver, um, could you, remake me host so I can launch uh, a few polls very shortly as well um, and and to follow up then on Morgan's points actually uh, Tom I would like to ask you then your point of view because Morgan highlighted people first and um, how important are people in, in going through uh, well this kind of unseen uh, situation yeah, I think that's a, a very good point. And, and it's in these critical situations that it highlights the different areas of the business that are starting to creak um, and emphasizes the challenges that are there. Um, and a lot of the time you find that people are the critical glue that are holding together processes, the systems, they've got a unique amount of knowledge that without that one individual, when you take that one individual out, if it's COVID and they're ill or it's furloughing, suddenly it puts a huge amount of stress on everything else around it. So, I mean, I fully agree that the, uh, the people element of that is a key thing to get right. Um, I would also say that through talking with a lot of the businesses that we do across a, a wide range, there was also a huge desire to get back to making money as well. So the, the P&L for businesses are hugely under stress. There's a lack of cash coming in. So from a senior level, it's getting back. How do we make money? And when you have this kind of crisis, it's making sure that you don't just go back to doing what you used to do. I don't think that's going to happen. I think there's going to be a new normal. But it's making sure you have got that right critical team in place, those critical people in place. And it's great to hear that OBS are, are putting that kind of strategic thinking in place at the beginning to actually work out what they need. Because then, then you start to look at what other systems I need for the future. Uh, what are the processes that I need to future? What has been working? What hasn't been working? Otherwise, you end up 18 months down the road, you've recovered from this crisis, and nobody wants it, but there could be a second wave. Um, these kind of 
catastrophe does happen on a not uh, infrequent basis, albeit much more localized. So this really is the, the highlighting of the challenge. So having the key people in place, I think is crucial. And certainly with the hiring perspective at a senior level, we've got customers that we work with where roles are being put on hold. Just because they cannot be completed, the face-to-face -face element couldn't happen. But actually it's now looking at how do we complete the hiring process without having that face-to-face -face element, bringing somebody on board because suddenly these hires and the people element has become even more critical than it was before. So we're starting to see that coming into place. The timescales are still quite open at the moment, but uh, a lot of the roles that were crucial for the organizations that we've been working with are, are getting a lot more focus again. I, I, I'll in here and, and make a point. The, I think that the, um, sorry, I'm getting some. Um, I think unless, unless companies are able to clear their backlogs um, and uh, then, then they're going to struggle to, to a lot of companies, especially those um, who have been more severely impacted by some of the, the uh, backlogs and the, um, the, the lumps that we talked about earlier. Unless people clear those backlogs, it's not going to give people a lot of room to think more strategically. You know, if you've got locker networks that are designed to run, you have to be able to get um, uh, parts back again filled with PPE stuff, that's great from a, you know, how things are changing. But you need to return stuff for a reason, right? It's got to come back. And if it doesn't come back, it doesn't get repaired. If it doesn't get repaired, it's not going to go back onto the shelf. And if it's not going back on the shelf, someone's got to buy new. So I think that until we can get and get, you know, people like Sam's and, and Rich's um, uh, networks running smoothly with a healthy movement of parts, that will be a kind of symptom, if you like, of recovery for our client service supply chains, being able to get stuff back to normal in order for them to, to allow people to think more strategically about how do we future-proof the business against the next wave? How do I, how do I digitize my service supply chain? Do, do I want to continue to do this kind of stuff in-house? And what are my options here? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, and actually, before we, we, we go on, I would like to launch um, two polls right now. Uh, so number one, which should pop up on everyone's screen, is the impact then on, on service supply chains and knowing so the impact of COVID-19 on, on service um, supply chains, what areas are you most concerned uh, about improving? So if I could ask um, everyone to just take a few seconds to fill it out and then I will share the results. And then very shortly, I will launch then a new poll to go back uh, on the point we were discussing with Tom regarding uh, people. So three, two, one, I will end the poll now and then we can see the results. So here, can everyone see the results? Anybody has a comment on the results, surprised or as expected? Raul? Uh, interesting, not, not surprised. I think, uh, you know, this, this is a, uh, in, I think what, what I, I, I agree to, to the visibility part a lot. I mean, I, I think, I think, you know, in, in the face of uh, a crisis of this time, of this nature, people want to know what's going on. I think it, it's really increased the desire to really know. And it's not just about know, it's know at speed. You want to know right away. You want to know where stock is and where should it move, right? And, and, and obviously that's one part of it. But then I think keeping your customers close, which is the, I mean, if you literally go in the order of, you know, where the 43% people are concerned about into invisibility, 24% on effective customer communication. I think it's so, so important to keep your customers close during the crisis, right? And obviously the other aspects matter, matter very much, you know, back to health, health and safety, export operations. But I think goes to connecting your, connecting with your customers and suppliers closely and having an end to end visibility, not just within your four walls, but in the ecosystem. Yeah. Makes sense. So another poll I wanted to then launch to go back to, to the point about uh, people and, um, so looking at the reliance on individuals. So how 
uh, reliant is your business on an individual when making critical service related de decisions such as spares planning and field service events management so give me a few seconds to to let answers come in and then we'll have some um, interesting results i think so three to one, I will end the poll and share the results. So a large majority is um, reliant on a combination of individual and system. We have almost a quarter very reliant on individuals, but no one is uh, systems driven. <laughs> Sam, I don't know, Oliver, if you, if you have any opinions or, or insights yep. on, on this. Yep. Well, a combination of the previous poll and what, what was just uh, reflected in, in the, the most recent uh, poll you just put up. What, what we're finding and what we have done over at Flash with our customers is first and foremost, um, and I agreed with the question earlier about is it tactical, is it strategic? Well, it's a combination of both because you do have to keep the day-to-day -day going and everybody's got their own angle and perspective on where they live in the service supply chain. We're right in the meat of it, right? Parts moving all over the world, uh, engineers, warehousing, global trade. Um, it's nonstop, 24-7, 365, and our customers expect that. So first and foremost, the communication uh, that customers expect and the alignment with customers about what's possible, what's not possible, specifically in light with what's been going on in the current business climate has been very critical and, and, and very beneficial for where what we've been able to provide to the customers and how they use that communication internally within their own companies to understand what is or isn't possible as they communicate to their end customer um, based upon what type of service events might be required. End-to-end um, -end visibility uh, is always uh, first and foremost uh, with, with the customers that we work with. That, that's nothing new. It's got a heightened emphasis now, of course. Um, but we've been uh, working with a lot of customers and customers are rethinking to Raul's point um, the end-to-end -end strategy about inventory positioning, where do you source inventory from, um, how do you and continue to try to drive velocity uh, in an environment where that's extremely uh, challenging and difficult. One of the things that we uh, push customers to go look for uh, and, you know, my background, I lived 20 years on the other side of the fence as well with OEMs and Fortune 50 companies running service supply chains. And so there's some gold mines that our customers go look for. Things like engineering units that kind of get lost in the shuffle or proof of concept gear that gets lost in the shuffle or take back programs for, uh, you know, follow on products that get lost in the shuffle that it can be a gold mine for service parts and spare parts and supporting those maintenance contracts in the field that um, customers um, tend to lose sight of. So we see our customers tightening up internally, how they can better themselves to really maximize all possible paths of inventory coming in. And then ultimately the things that have already been mentioned about some of the backlogs, the lumps in the supply chain, repair lines being shut down, manufacturing not being able to produce as much new parts and products, all very true. So in times like this, it's when you get creative, you have to tighten up and get better in those areas where maybe you're a little bit sloppy and not, uh, not having your eye on the prize. And we're finding our customers doing that and we're trying to lead them to go do that. But yeah, visibility and communication uh, at the top of the list. And then from my perspective and what we're doing to enable those things to happen, the health and safety of the employees and the workers, because we have a lot of workers out on the front line and warehouses, drivers, um, you know, ensuring that whatever needs to be delivered is getting delivered and delivered safely. And so I also see as we move forward, and I know we haven't gotten into that yet, but what, what I see moving forward is that, you know, we've had a big push over the last, though, say, two years for data security. And, and are, you know, are you ISO 27000 compliant about the data and just the security around what your customers are sharing with you and how you manage that uh, within your own company on behalf of your customers? Health security I don't think it's going to be very far behind that as far as what protocols, what's expected, what the standards are going to be in order for those frontline workers to continue to be safe and deliver things uh, to our customers collectively 
uh, in a way that everybody's comfortable with. So um, that's a little bit of color behind my thoughts and perspective. <laughs> Great. Well, actually, that brings me then to kind of the next phase of the discussion and really looking um, because I, I know in the video there was a, a phrase about, um, you know, things will get back to normal. But then, you know, what is the new normal going to look like? Are we going to really go back to exactly the same way, whether it's in society or in business or in our personal lives or the way we work and other things, uh, exactly back to the way we were? Or is there going to be a pre a COVID-19 way of life and then a post one. So uh, b before we get um, into a discussion on this, I actually have another poll I would like to launch and, and then get the audience's opinion. Um, so it should be popping up now. So which of the following uh, is your biggest concern about post-COVID life for your business? So if everyone could just take a few seconds to go through the questions and, and answer them, and then we can discuss those points. And we'll have some interesting answers there as well, actually. And from that uh, discussion, we also had a, a few questions come in actually before the webinar started via email. So I would like to um, ask that in relation to, to post COVID business life. And I will end the poll now. And so um, I will share the results. And then I will ask Rich uh, if you can give me uh, your opinion uh, on these results, as expected or surprised? Um, no, as expected. Um, I think both the answer to this question and the other question about visibility were not surprising to me. Um, to, to talk about the new normal, uh, Thomas, I think that if we want to look at the silver lining here, we've got an opportunity to turn uh, field service and the field service supply chain really into a strategic differentiator here going forward um, out of a reactive mode. You know, over the years, companies have spent uh, quite a bit of money on, on trying to optimize their engineers. Uh, but if the engineer gets there and the part's not there, then we haven't really solved the problem. And so, so we need to really focus on that. And it needs to be a senior level discussion going back to what what Sam had said is there's multiple variables here now uh, as well, right? So in addition to, in a lot of companies or in some companies anyway, these decisions are siloed. So the guy responsible for SLAs just says, well, look, just stuff the van stock or put more inventory out there. And then the finance guy says, well, wait a minute, we, we, we can't do that, right? And so, um, you, you know, you've got, you've got uh, that role and then it's, well, okay, let's, let's uh, do something else. So well, we can't really do that. And now we've got the health and safety aspect of it, of, of, of uh, are we sure that we're going to be safe in touching these, these, uh, these parts? And so we, we need to move this. We have the opportunity to move the conversation to the senior level and have it be a source of strategic differentiation because uh, the field service is, is sometimes the first and only contact that the customer has with the company. So we've got the opportunity to, to delight that person or really irritate them and let the competition in. And so by, by looking at this holistically and looking at the new, norm, uh, the, the new normal and what is the total cost of, of the solution, you know, sending out same day all the time is not the answer. Stocking up on inventory is not the answer. We have to move together and figure out what all these parts are and what are the total costs of, and risks of the solution. So, so I do think there is an opportunity here and, and I'm, I'm, I'm seeing more and more uh, senior level uh, conversations like this one uh, around this topic. So that, that does make me encouraged. Okay. Well, I, I have a question actually that came in then before the, the webinar started. Um, and so I'll read it out and then whoever wants to comment on this. Uh, so talk to any CFO and they'll likely tell you that uh, cash has always been king. So with companies now protecting their cash more than ever, do you think that post-COVID-19 
will drive a change in the length of contractual payment terms suppliers are willing or able to accept. Uh, I'll, I'll jump in real yep. quickly here. Um, even before COVID-19, this was uh, always, or continues to be a challenge. Um, uh, COVID, the COVID and the pandemic, it, you know, just puts a little bit more stress um, on, on that dynamic. But, um, you know, what we're finding is that, um, I would say greater than 90% of the time, there's a middle ground that's found. But yeah, that, that, that question, that request, the stretching uh, of holding on to cash, stretching out payment uh, terms, uh, that, that, that's an ongoing thing. This is just putting a little bit more emphasis on it. Uh, but, uh, you know, from, from my perspective and, and the uh, interaction that we've had with customers, they're being very uh, reasonable with it. Uh, and, and what I always like to say to folks is that, um, you know, common sense, logic, and reason, you know, don't throw it out the window, right? When you're with your customers, you're with your customers in a partnership. And, and if it's not truly a partnership, uh, that's when things can go a little bit south or sideways. Uh, and so, you know, uh, I think that's also a variable in, in that dynamic that you have to take into consideration who you're partnered with and what they're willing or not willing to do as far as uh, a give or take. I, I'd like to jump in with, with a couple of perspectives on this. I think, uh, following on from what Sam was saying, I think there is a, um, you know, no, as, a, as a customer said to me just, just the other day, um, when, when, when cash is down, never underestimate the, you know, the potential for, for stupidity to rain, right? So you could, you could you, if, if a company is down on, on top line, then even though a lot of that revenue uh, from annuity customers ongoing business might be being generated and supported by the service business, the service operation, um, you know, top-down orders about things like um, payment terms to, to, to suppliers um, or, or to, um, you know, consolidation or, 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 or demanded cost cuts are, are always a potential. They're always a possibility. But I would also say that there is no greater way to tie up cash in a business than to buy a ton of inventory, right? And if you, if you go out there and say, right, if we can't get this machine running again, if we can't clear these back backlogs, and give ourselves some breathing space, then our only option to carry on supporting customers is gonna to be to start to inject a huge amount of cash into that. So um, to the point, I think it was uh, Richard's point, also Rahul's point earlier, you can't, there is a need to, and I think COVID-19 has done this very, um, has given an opportunity for this to happen, to elevate the conversation about things like how much cash inventory, um, uh, how much cash gets tied up in inventory in the service supply chain, to a C level, in, uh, and for that conversation to be held alongside any conversations about, oh, maybe we should now ask for an extra 30 days of payment terms to, to free up a bit of cash. Because if you, if you weigh up what you spend on your suppliers and you spend on your vendors uh, to manage your service supply chain versus how much you would spend on inventory to inject if your repair volumes are down just 10% and you're, you're a manufacturer that relies heavily on repaired stock, the two of them are not even vaguely close to one another. Morgan, I, you, you. <laughs> I've lived and breathed that this one, um, both, uh, both, both in my current role and in previous roles. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. I think you know the the, the need for all of us within the supply chain to become P and L experts and be able to have those kind of conversations with the CFO has probably never been more important. We have to look at what we're doing as a critical differentiator within the business. We can be the difference between success and failure for our organizations. So we have to understand what's going on and the impact of our decisions, both on the customer experience and on the business performance. Uh, the, the, the number of conversations I've had just recently about you know, extending terms, and, and it ripples through the system really, really quickly. You have it in a couple of countries that ripples up to a group level, up to a regional level and very, very quickly on, it's then rippling into your supplier base. So going back all the way into the OEMs. So it, it, being able to understand you know, what's driving it, how we're operating as an ecosystem, 
and being able to come up with the value-based answers rather than just the cost-based answers is going to be absolutely critical coming out of this. But again, I think it's brought the focus back on understanding the value that supply chain, service supply chain or product supply chain can provide if, it's, if you invest in it properly, if it has the right systems, data, analytics and people in it, you get back far, far more than you spend when you run it properly. Well, to, to follow up then on the, on the cash question, and actually this is a, a question coming from the audience. Um, so because as Oliver mentioned, uh, you know, how much cash is in inventory, any thoughts about the role that this uh, situation might have on the shift to a more sustainable or circular supply chain model? You can see it in a couple of the polls here. You know, people are saying they would like this in the, in the space of this conversation. People want to have con, um, uh, uh, visibility about their inventory. People are concerned about the ability to get stock um, at the right price that's available. And not a single person said that they had a system led uh, uh, operation today. Right. So you, I mean, there is a, for, for me, those, those three polls tell a very concise story, which is, you know, if you, you, if you look at the if you look at the panelists on this, you're only going. I imagine you're only going to get nodding heads, which is when you ask the question. You know, does the service supply chain need to need to go digital? I, yes, of course it does. I mean, we need to follow other industries and other parts of the supply chain that have embedded technology and systems into understanding things like the customer experience and and the operating cash and capex that needs to go into making that customer experience happen and linking those things together. Um, and I, and, I, and I think that, um, if anything, COVID-19 has accelerated the journey of that more front and center in, in, in senior people's minds. Yeah, I think it's, there's also the, 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 I guess it's the aspect, and I think Sam, you mentioned it, about velocity. I mean, I think this really starts to bring back into very, very sharp focus the systems and the processes you need to increase the velocity within your supply chain. And not just outbound, but that reverse loop as well, the visibility into repair, uh, repair organizations, and then how does that then get back out into your network in the, right, uh, in the right volumes? So velocity has got to be balanced up against this as well, because there's always a cost to velocity. Yeah, and, we, and, and to piggyback on that, what we're finding is you know, many of our customers are looking for that um, you know localized test and screening of supposed defective inventory coming back uh, right to significantly reduce your landed cost get that inventory back into good supply circulating with much more velocity versus going all the way back to the um, you know the manufacturer uh, or the ODM whoever the customer is leveraging to just even see if a component or the product is defective. And, and we're still finding, it should be no surprise, that at least 35% of what comes back is trouble found. It was a software issue to begin with um, and putting that uh, inventory right back on the shelf so that it can be used and avoid the new buys or uh, the procurement of new spare parts that has been mentioned earlier. Perfect, <laughs> thanks Sam. Um, we are clocking in at already 60 minutes now in the discussion. So what I would like to do is uh, move forward with two more polls with the audience and one actually looking at um, what capability improvements. So over the next year, what is going to be your top focus or priority area for improving your service supply chain capabilities to better serve your customers? Um, and so again, if I can ask everyone to take a few seconds to answer the poll and then we can quickly see um, what the results have shown and if anyone has some uh, comment or insight on this. So three, two, one, and I will end the poll right now and so share the results so here you can see and actually we haven't talked so much I mean, we've talked about analytics and um, a bit earlier and systems but we haven't really talked about 
digital. So maybe uh, we can spend the last part um, of the discussion because we also had a question actually from, from the audience about what role would, will digital play in the return of critical parts and, and high value inventory. So, so how much of a role is digital playing um, at least in the new normal? I, 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 okay, Morgan, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, I, I, this one of, one of my pet subjects, so I'm happy to jump in and talk about this one all day, and I'll try not to suck all of the air out of the room. Um, I, I, it cannot be underestimated, I think, at the moment, um, the the need for digitization. I mean, we, we've seen a, we've seen a global workforce move from you know, what is it, eighty odd percent of people still working in offices to you know. 80 90 percent of people working working from home almost overnight and the stresses and the strains that that put on various elements of the network um, to enable people to continue to work effectively was was an indication i think of how little we've actually focused on truly digitizing the workplace so it's not just supply chain it's the workplace in general um, I, I think the need to focus on it in the supply chain as it in most organizations is such a huge cost area, um, has never been more important. I think being able to get consistent data from start to finish in the supply chain can remain, remains one of the biggest challenges that we have, but is probably one of the most critical elements we have to deal with. Creating, as one of the polls said, visibility, so event-based uh, management can take place, so we can move from reactive to proactive within our supply chains being able to have the data and the analytics to make good decisions and make those good decisions fast, to have the ability to track and trace the movement of product to get it back in the supply chain quickly, that velocity aspect. I, mean, I could go on and on and on about this one. I don't think there's ever been a more important time than, get to, to, get, than to get digitization on the agenda. And to that end with, with, with Orange, that's the concept commit proposal that I've just put in about, about three or four weeks ago. Look, guys, this is, this is the way we need to move forward. If we're going to be successful and retain a competitive position, this is the level of digitization that needs to take place and roundly accepted. Um, so I think I would encourage everybody on here to really take a hard look at what the opportunity is. Because if we digitize, then we move, we move our people away from doing transactional work, which is low value add, to moving them into positions where they can add value, gain experience, and really deliver customer experience. And that's the key. It's not about getting rid of people. This is about moving them into areas where they can add more value and deliver that higher customer experience. So she'll step off, step off the soapbox now. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with it. Sorry, Rich, yeah, go ahead. No, no, I, I was just going to say this is the world we live in uh, as well. And what we focus on is that, is that the, the ability to move the product close to the point of service, close to the field service edge, to know where it is at any point in time. And also the one thing we haven't uh, talked about is the ability to dynamically reallocate that product in the event that, uh, that something changes on the day of service. And if you're going to be able to do that, you have to, ha you have to digitize, you have to know where the product is, you have to know who's touching it. You have to be able to securely uh, change who can touch it at one point in time and then time and date stamp all of that in terms of what's happened to it. Uh, and so the digitization is going to be uh, continue to be critically important and it's all part of this, uh, looking at this more holistically and more strategically going forward. Yeah. Just to add to that, if I can, having come from the telecoms world before setting up our people, the, uh, the digitization and the visibility that keeps coming up um, often the solution to the problems that we had um, or that you could see was that it wasn't necessarily the spare parts it was where they were sitting and the access to them and the visibility of them so they were potentially there but they were sitting in a different opco uh, in a different country they were stranded or they were old there's a lot of very old equipment which is potentially reusable redeployable that's sitting as a stranded asset that has got a cash value against it which can be released if it is cataloged in the right way and repatriated in the right way. So often the solution is there and the digitization and the, and the visibility that comes from that is a key element. 
<laughs> Perfect. Um, I know we have a few more questions coming from the audience, but unfortunately we're also um, running out of time because um, we have quite a lot of points that we ran through. And um, so what I think I will do now actually to kind of <laughs> summarize things, uh, I have a last poll I would like to run uh, asking everyone about, um, so if they had had a crystal ball in January, where would they have placed uh, their bets, their bets to speed up uh, ability to respond to both the downturn and the eventual upturn? Uh, inventory, technology and connectivity, people or data and analytics. Um, so let's see the results. And then after that, I will ask all the panelists to give me a short summary of um, really the, the main point or, or the main key takeaway from their perspective that they would like to leave uh, to the audience. And for any questions we have not been able to answer live, uh, I think Oliver, we can probably uh, organize to follow up by email personally to, to all the um, people that had those questions. Yes, of course. Yeah. Okay, so I will end the crystal ball poll and share the results. So, yeah, well, we finished with digital, but yeah, data analytics um, comes out on top, which I think is, is probably not so surprising for, for anyone. Or Good, but then if we can go with the um, kind of closing summary, um, Rich, do you want to start with yours? Sure, I, I've mentioned a lot of this, so in the interest of time, I won't belabor it, but I, I would just say that even before COVID, it was obvious that here we live in what I'll call the Amazon age, uh, you know, people, uh, the companies that are going to be successful are the ones that meet the ever increasing customer expectations in terms of first time fix and service levels, et cetera. And COVID has just exacerbated that. And so if we can take the opportunity to move the conversation into the C-suite uh, and make it and look at it holistically so that we can turn field service into a, uh, a source of differentiation by, improving the vis visibility, improving the analytics and the intelligence, that's where we need to go with this. I think that's been a common theme throughout the polls. Um, and, and I think that we have an opportunity now uh, to, to do that and to look at it uh, in that light and just sort of adding health and safety to the list of things that we need to, uh, to include as well. Thanks. Thanks, Rich. Uh, Tom, do you wanna go? Yeah, sure. So, um, to paraphrase Mike Tyson, everyone has a plan until you are punched in the face. And I think many or most organizations have got a pretty bloody nose from, from COVID. So for me, it brings aftermarket, which is often an afterthought, to the fore. And hopefully that will enable organizations to look at what was the challenge with their managed services and how do we fix this immediate problem, this backlog that we've got, but also plan for the long term. Um, there's a theme of visibility and systems, and that's consistent across everything. So, um, seen it before, the systems often aren't fit for purpose. So there's a real look uh, internally that needs to be done to say, have we got the right systems across an organization globally? And then do we have the right people to actually go and implement it? Do we have the right knowledge and expertise within the organization to take the data that we've got, analyze it and deliver the right solution? So it seems to be that message underneath everything that's happening. Thanks. Morgan, what about you? So I'll go back to one of the, the earlier points that I made, which was, I guess, relating to, to scenario planning. Uh, don't leave this to chance. Really get into thinking very broadly about your business and across multiple scenarios. Um, if you think that we're just going to come out of this slow and steady or everything's going to go back to normal in three to six months, uh, you're probably in the wrong job. You need to think very deeply about the impact it's going to have across your business, with your business and uh, with your business partners and all of their capabilities, your people in particular. And I can't stress this enough that every single member of our organizations has been through varying levels of stress personally, within their families, 
uh, over the last few months, bringing them back into a work environment that suddenly explodes or becomes very, very uncertain is going to ask us to, as leaders to be very resilient and to build structure around people to make sure they can continue to do the things we need them to do. So I can't emphasize enough about the people aspect about this. And last, of course, but not least, as our customers, our customers' expectations are going to change. They have already changed. If you think about this too narrowly, you're gonna get caught out, you're gonna miss something. This is a chance to differentiate and get a competitive advantage if you do this the right way. Perfect, <laughs> thanks for that. And <laughs> Sam, by the way, I must say, uh, from the time you logged in, because you're based all the way in California, so I've been able to notice the sun's um, yeah. set in, or yeah, the sun go up in, in the background, right? So, yeah, yeah. So yeah, thanks for fun. joining us <laughs> all the way from California. What, what is, um, yeah, what is your summary? Yeah, you know, a, a lot of common themes here, which, um, you know, isn't a bad thing. Uh, my summary, um, you know, as we speak to our customers and those listening here, uh, maneuverability, flexibility, um, reshaping uh, not only how you do business day in and day out to support your customer base and the SLAs you need to achieve, but also what you do from a business continuity perspective of the just in case what if something happens, which is happening right now, but how you go attack that in looking at what the risk profile might be like. So we always say about right part, right place, right time, or right person, right labor, right place, right time. What's the risk profile against that moving forward? You know, what's that risk tolerance level? Uh, taking into consideration profit margins, right? And then ultimately, how you want to shape your service supply, service supply chain infrastructure to meet the demands and the needs of the customers, knowing that there could be things that cause um, some turns left or right and cause things to go sideways in your ability to support those customers with whatever industry you're in uh, in order to get that done. So, you know, we're already seeing a strong push from our customers reshaping their network, uh, reshaping their uh, planning strategy. Um, and and, and I'll, I'll close with this, uh, and, and I've been in this industry a long time, a, a long time. You can create predictability and consistency in your service supply chain if you set it up properly. Yes, digitization is a big part of that. People are also a big part of that. Um, you need to have the platform which to enable that to take place, of course, and create the visibility that you need. But predictability and consistency based upon sets of business rules is very real, very doable. Companies have been doing it for years. Now's the time to be tightening that up and modifying and adjusting um, so that you can turn knobs and switches and make things happen from a technology perspective and then ultimately to deliver and fulfill the needs of your customer um, with whatever the situation uh, comes along uh, in the world. And you know, it's unfortunate what's happening. I know we're starting to push through it. Um, and you know, health and safety again, top of the list. But uh, you know, it, it's, it's an interesting time it, and it's ripe with opportunity. It's absolutely ripe with opportunity. And I see many of our customers taking advantage of that. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Good. Um, Raul? Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> I think, you know, a few, a few things which I, I really uh, latched on to, you know, that the panelists said, uh, you know, M M Morgan, I really like the point, Morgan, you made about, you know, the value-based versus cost-based decisions. I think that's so, so critical. You look at the overall ecosystem that we live in, you know, in the supply chain and, and look at the value across the board, whether the value is coming from, let's say, you know, back to the question that was there about, you know, just, just kind of take circular economy, for example. You know, this is the time to assess new different ideas, you know, which might drive us forward, whether it's evaluating the value of circular economy in a service supply chain, or it is looking at, in the points Sam made earlier about, you know, one of the many great points over there, the health security, for example. When I look at, so the many changes here coming in are about structure. Uh, it's about creating a, you know, like Rich said, you know, a strategic differentiation through a service supply chain. Uh, 
But at the end of the day, I think the way, if there's one thought I want to leave, leave with is that at the end of the day, it's not just about our company, it's about the ecosystem we live in. So we are living in, we have our workforce, we have our customers, we have our suppliers, we have the economy. So we have to convert that to the right digital ecosystem to make sense of all the information hitting us. And I think this is the right time to make that change and shift our way of thinking to a more structurally new way of thinking. This is just a crisis that led us there. We have to really survive the crisis, but but kind of recreate uh, the, the, the supply chain in a way. Thanks for that. And well, last but not least, uh, Oliver. Um, three things. One, um, I, I clear, clear your backlog. Right, so I think companies get on top of your backlog, get back to your customers, um, get the stock back, get it flowing again, get the CFO off your back, right? So get stuff moving again. Number um, two, embrace your data, um, I think is a, is, a, is a clear conclusion from this. Embrace your data. Number three, get in the digital conversation. If you look at this panel, as all the, getting in the digital conversation is not about one vendor or one supplier having the right solution for everything. It's about understanding that the service supply chain there are plenty of vendors out there who understand what going digital means for the service supply chain and understand the power of what data can do in the service supply chain. I think it's very easy to manage um, the service supply chain on a, well, this is the way that we always did it mentality. But if COVID-19 has taught us anything, I love the Mike Tyson reference from Tom. We all just got punched in the face. Maybe it's a good time to think, I'm going to stop standing where I'm standing just because I always stood here. <laughs> Um, so clear the backlog, embrace data, and get in the digital conversation. Uh, perfect. Thanks. Um, well, the one point I will add, actually, as, as my summary, is uh, echoing a bit Morgan and Tom looking into people. Um, I think there is a lot of companies that unfortunately have gone or are going bankrupt or have to let go people uh, across sectors. So there is a lot of good, good talent out there. So I think a lot of um, companies have been able to kind of pinpoint what their shortcomings internally is from these past couple of weeks or, or past two months or so. So you kind of know where the gap is within your organization. So now is actually a good time to invest in people as well. Uh, not only developing your own people, but also investing in new people to fill the gap where you need to go whether that's into analytics or data or supply chain planners or supply chain analysts, um, look into that area as well. I would like to, well, thank all the panelists, uh, Morgan, Sam, Raul, Rich, Tom, and Oliver for your time today. I know we went uh, almost close to 80 minutes. It was a lot of uh, good, interesting points. It was also a lot of points we were unfortunately not able to discuss, which we had kind of maybe planned on, but I think you will have a follow-up session next week, more US-based um, for some of you that you'll be able to touch upon that. For all the participants uh, still with us, we will be sending out a recording of the discussion later on, as well as um, the results from the polls and, and kind of a follow-up. So um, that recording will probably come tomorrow. With that being said, also, if you had questions asked and not answers, again, we will come back to you with the answers later on. So thank you very much for your time and I um, hope to see you at an upcoming Copperberg webinar. Thank you very much, gentlemen, once again. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Take care.